On this week's Nesson Patriots podcast, we will recap New England's 2019 season, including their wild card round loss to the Tennessee Titans. Plus, we will see what Tom Brady will be up to this offseason, and we'll talk about where he might play in 2020. Hello and welcome to the Nesson Patriots podcast. I am Doug Kide, joined as always by Zach Cox. We are in a different location than usual. Usually tape this from the Patriots media workroom. And now we are back in the Nesson office, the studio, uh, because Patriots season is over. Yeah, back in the studio. I think this is the first podcast we've done from, uh, from Nesson HQ since OTAs, maybe? Yeah. Like back in May. It's been a long time. And the, the reason we, that we are here and not at Gillette Stadium is because this as you mentioned, the Patriots season is over about a, uh, a month or so earlier than it has been in the last couple of years. And I think earlier than, than every Patriots fan was expecting. But yeah, it's off season in early January. It's crazy times around here. Yeah, we will get into that Titans game in a second. Obviously, uh, Patriots lost 2013 to the Titans in the wild card round of the playoffs on Saturday night. But I just wanted to talk about the season as a whole real quick off the, off the top. Because, I mean, there was a point in this season where the Patriots were undefeated. I forgot what their record was. Was it 8-0, 9-0, eight no. something like that? 8-0. No. There was talk that the Patriots potentially could go undefeated during the 2019 season. So I think it's at least worth looking back to see what went wrong during this season and, and why that conversation changed and how this season took such a dramatic downturn for the Patriots. Because, yeah, they started off 8-0, no, finished the season 4-4, four and four, and then lost in the first round of the playoffs. And to some degree, I, I'm certainly not going to use the the fraud word that everyone throws around because I think that everyone's just doing a, a Mike Felger impression when they use that word. But I do think that the start of the season for the Patriots, they had an easier schedule and a lot of things were bouncing their way. And once the season got more difficult, I think they did kind of start to show themselves a little bit more. Yeah, the, the beginning of the Patriots schedule, really the first half of the Patriots schedule was extremely soft mm-hmm. overall. I mean, there, there was a quality road win over the Buffalo Bills in there. There was a blowout of a Steelers team that looked terrible at the time, ended right. up almost getting into the playoffs. So I think both of those were quality wins. But, yeah, you've got uh, the, the other games in there. 43 nothing over the, over the Dolphins. Two big wins over the Jets. A win over the Browns, who were a disaster this season. Uh, Redskins, Giants. It was some of the worst teams in the NFL uh, the Patriots played during that span. And then once the, once the level of competition rose up, beginning with that Baltimore Ravens game back in week nine, the Patriots didn't look like the same team. They only scored more than 25, or they only reached 25 points once in their last nine games, and that was against the Bengals, who uh, belong in that camp that I was just talking about, right. about the worst teams in the NFL. Against all of these, these, this quality competition, the Patriots were average mm-hmm. and and when you're average like that against fe- other playoff teams and and teams like the uh like the Cowboys that just missed out on the playoffs you can't really expect to have a, a long Super Bowl run and I've been I've been asking I've been asked a couple times this week whether this loss to the Titans was surprising and shocking I think the fact that the Patriots are out of the super uh, or out of the playoffs so quickly that is surprising but this loss itself isn't very surprising just given what we've seen from this team really since Halloween. The Patriots did not look like a Super Bowl contender. They didn't even look like the favorite in their own conference for months now. They met up with a team that was a bad matchup for them, and the fact that they lost, I don't think anybody was nearly as flabbergasted by this game as they were uh, by the Dolphins game a week before. No, definitely not. Yeah, uh, we can get into that Titans game. Lost 2013. Uh, it was a close game for, for really the entire game. Patriots did have a six-point lead at one point. Uh, then they let up a touchdown before the half. Patriots did not put up any points in the second half. And the only points that the Titans put up were a pick six in the final seconds of the game by Logan Ryan uh, when Tom Brady was targeting Mohamed Sanu. The ball was batted up in the air. Ryan picked it off and had an easy pick six. Only had to run about 10 yards for that one. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Patriots had chances to win. Uh, I think that, you know, it was probably, if you're just going to blame one side of the ball over the other, offense would probably be more to blame for that loss than the defense. Uh, but, you know, the Patriots' defense did let up 14 points in the first half. They did let up a ton of rushing yards to Derrick Henry. Um, but the Patriots' offense needs to put up more than 13 points in order to win that game, or more than 
Uh, yeah, 13 points. Thir- 13 points, yeah. 13 points, no points in the second half, as you mentioned. Uh, the real pivotal sequence was right there at the end of the first half. The Patriots drove all the way down the field. I believe it was a 75-yard drive. Uh, had three shots from the one or two-yard line. Uh, tried three running plays. Didn't get into the end zone on any of them. Uh, some really good plays by Rashawn Evans, the uh, the Titans linebacker, uh, Jeffrey Simmons, some of these other mm-hmm. uh, players on, on Tennessee's defensive front. Very good defensive plays by them, but it's when you're down on the one yard line with three shots to get into the end zone, you need to get into the end zone there, especially yeah. because Patriots settled for a field goal there, went up 13, seven. Then the Titans drove straight down the field in, in less than two minutes and, and scored what proved to be the game winning touchdown by Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry had an awesome game for Tennessee uh, running the ball and ended up as one of their most productive pass catchers too, because yeah. Ryan Tannehill was basically a non-factor in this entire game. It was all Derrick Henry finished with 182 rushing yards added uh, 22 more yards on a screen pass that set up that touchdown. So that's obviously not a not a, a good result for, for the Patriots' defense, but the fact that they only allowed 14 points to a team that had been scoring in the 30s ever since Ryan Tannehill took over as quarterback a couple months back, it's, it's, it's hard for me to blame this loss on the defense. You, you need to score. If, if your defense only allows 14 points in a playoff game, you need to win that playoff game. Yeah, and I mean, the Patriots allowed less than 300 uh, yards on in total offense in that game as well. Uh, Patriots offense actually put up more yards than the Titans in that game, which is somewhat surprising. And Brady had another you know, kind of subpar performance, 20-37, 209 yards, no touchdowns, one interception. Um, intercept, he almost threw another pick six at the end of the first half, but that would have been a, a drop by Ben Watson. It was kind of off his fingertips. It wasn't the greatest throw by Brady, but I mean, we just saw a lot of what we did throughout the season. And that's the fact that he really wasn't getting on the same page as a lot of his receivers. Uh, he targeted Nikhil Harry twice, uh, or he targeted Nikhil Harry seven times, two catches for 21 yards from the rookie. He targeted Mohamed Sanu five times, one catch for 11 yards for, for Sanu. And I mean, yeah, that's 12 targets, three receptions, 32 yards from those two receivers who just never really got on the same page as Tom Brady throughout the entire season. And I watched all of their targets last night, uh, wrote something up on that this morning, and it was a decent amount of miscommunication between the uh, between them. Uh, there was one pretty bad drop from Harry on a screen pass, but otherwise it was Brady's passes weren't where guys were, and they were either behind them or, or in front of them. And I a lot of them didn't particularly seem like accuracy issues, more just Brady was expecting to be expecting someone to be where they weren't essentially on the play and uh there were a couple overthrows on deep balls which i would probably chalk up to being brady's fault but i don't know i think that's just sort of what it came down to on offense because patriots ran the ball pretty well in this game their offensive line blocked actually really well throughout the last three games of the season both as run blockers and as pass blockers it really just came down to tom brady and his receiving threats not being able to connect a lot of the time yeah the miscommunication that you mentioned really Kate was evident on the very first play of the game. Yeah. Uh, it, was a, it was a quick hitch by, by Nikhil Harry. It looked like Tom Brady wanted him to run a five-yard hitch, ended up like six and a half yards yeah. downfield, had to dive, couldn't make the catch. And you see the reaction immediately from Brady. It was, it was something like, what the hell, man? Like, we can't <laughs> right. just, what was this guy doing? We just need to get on the same page. And obviously they never did. That was really the story of the, the second half of this season. And especially after Julian Edelman began regressing a little bit over these last couple of games, both because of injuries and because other teams could basically just overload onto him because yeah. they knew that no that there were really no other receiving threats. I mean, in this game, Tom Brady went seven of twenty one when targeting wide mm-hmm. receivers. Uh, Julian Edelman had uh, some decent plays. I mean, he had some nice third down conversions. Also had a really costly drop mm-hmm. uh, on the Patriots' last legitimate offensive possession that that would have been a first down. They end up punting. Uh, as you mentioned, two for two for seven for Nikhil Harry. Uh, uh, Josh McDaniel spoke recently about wanting to get Nikhil Harry more involved in the offense, and they did. I mean, he saw he seven tried, t- yeah. seven targets in each of the Patriots' last two games. Only caught five passes over that span. That's going to be something. I mean, people are calling him a bust already. That's too early. Yeah, I mean, calm he, down on that. Guy missed the entire preseason. Missed yeah. the first half of the season. Did not meet expectations in his rookie year. You can definitely say that. But let's let's give him a full off season and 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 some time with. Some more time in this offense before you kind of write him off completely. But 
the Patriots needed him to step up, needed uh, Muhammad Sanu to step up. Sanu is a guy who's been great, or not great, but he's been solid, very good yeah. at everywhere else he's been in his career. Never really came to, to – couldn't put it together with the Patriots right. for whatever reason. And we, we that that's what was one of our main points on the pregame show. You need one, if not both, of those two guys to step up in this game because you know how much – that uh, how much attention Tennessee was going to be paying to Julian Edelman. Neither of them did. Patriots only scored 13 points. Yeah, and I mean, I, yeah, the the Sanu thing and the, the Harry thing, I've seen people call Harry a boss. Like you said, I've seen a lot of people saying that the Patriots should cut Muhammad Sanu. I think that you need both those guys to – click for next season for this offense to get back together and I think it's that's entirely possible I mean uh as you mentioned Nikhil Harry missed the first half of the season on injury reserve so I think that kind of explains away some of his issues uh getting back on the same page with Tom Brady and Mohamed Sanu came in at midseason and Patriots just really didn't adjust their offense enough to get those guys involved uh the way that they should have so there's gonna be a lot of changes next season in the Patriots offense we expect but those two guys are coming back so they're gonna have to be you know either your number two or three your number three or four wide receivers in the system next season and those aren't bad guys to be your number two or three or three or four so um the the, the Patriots definitely need to focus on getting those guys on the same page with everyone next season uh to have that offense clicking on its full potential but let's get into the offseason a little bit uh, the, the top storyline, obviously, is Tom Brady, who is a free agent. It's kind of funny looking at the Patriots' Wikipedia roster right now because their quarterbacks are Cody Kessler and Jared Stidham. Uh, not used to seeing that since this is the first time that Tom Brady has been a free agent in his NFL career. Um, and then Josh McDaniels is interviewing with three teams, the New York Giants, the Cleveland Browns, and the Carolina Panthers. The Patriots' offensive coordinator also could be gone next season. Uh, and then there's a lot of free agents on this roster as well. Jamie Collins, uh, Nate Ebner, uh, Ted Karras, Devin McCourty, Elandon Roberts, Danny Shelton, Matthew Slater, Joe Tooney, Kyle Van Noy, and then restricted free agent uh, Adam Butler. So a lot of very important guys who very well could not be back next season but let's start in on Brady uh I don't think anyone really knows if he's coming back or not and I think that if anyone tells you one way or the other I I, maybe they know something at that point that Tom Brady doesn't know because I I don't think that even Tom Brady knows where he's going to be next season yeah I honestly don't think Tom Brady knows where he's going to be either Uh, I don't know what he whether he has a kind of a thought in mind of what he wants an ideal situation for him but yeah I, I think it's going to it's going to take another couple months uh, until he hears and, and finds out kind of what options are out there because he did say in his interview with, with Peter King that was published this morning, he said he wants to explore his options. Right. Um, he, he didn't rule out returning to the Patriots. He didn't rule out signing somewhere else. He basically said he doesn't want to retire unless nobody wants him. Um, so it, there, there's a pretty good chance that Tom Brady will be playing football somewhere next season but this is going to be a, a something that I don't think we're going to have any resolution to anytime soon because I would honestly be pretty surprised I, I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Brady ends up somehow coming back to the Patriots right. but I would be surprised if they came to a, a contract extension before he hits free agency on March 18th because from everything that Tom Brady has said and and just sort of reading this whole season for him it does seem like he at the very least wants to see what else is out there for him yeah, and um, I don't know how much will be out there for him. I think that you know the Chicago Bears could be a possibility, but that would potentially mean learning a new offense for him. Um, I think the Los Angeles Chargers could be a possibility. <laughs> One team that I've seen thrown around is the Indianapolis Colts because they need a quarterback, but I mean, is Tom Brady really going to play for the Indianapolis Colts? I, I can't really imagine that. Rivalry's back on. Uh, given, like, the deflate gate situation given that's where Peyton Manning played that would just be very bizarre to me uh, another team I guess that would be possible would be the Denver Broncos even though they've got uh, Drew Locke in there who actually looked pretty good this season but I, I don't know there's not one super obvious situation the, the most obvious one would be if Josh McDaniels got hired by the Carolina Panthers but I don't know does Tom Brady really want to play for the Carolina Panthers yeah it, it doesn't seem like I mean, it's all kind of conjecture because nobody's really, or Tom Brady certainly hasn't said anything about it. I don't even know if I've seen any kind of actual real reporting, but it would just be weird if Tom Brady went to a small market team right. like Carolina. Tampa Bay. I was, yeah, I was, I was on the radio with a station in Tampa Bay earlier. They're like, all right, what are the chances that Tom Brady's <laughs> going to be a buck? And I was like, 
very low, I yeah. think. Uh, I mean, maybe, but that just it, – it would really surprise me if he goes to a, a small market or a team that's not kind of a banner franchise. Right. I, I don't know, just with his whole TB12 brand and everything, because obviously that's what he wants to uh, continue doing after football. I don't know. It's it seems Tennessee like Tennessee is another he, one. Tennessee, yeah, Tennessee is another one. It would be uh, it, that one would make a little more sense with the Ra- the Vrabel right. connection and and John Robinson connection. But yeah, it's it it really does seem like a pretty short list of teams that would make obvious sense for Tom Brady from a a salary cap perspective from a quarterback neediness perspective yeah. and from just an overall general franchise slash market perspective it doesn't seem like there are a lot of obvious suitors but if I'm a team that needs a quarterback that has the money to that needs to drum up some interest I would absolutely throw more money than Tom Brady deserves at Tom Brady for yeah. another two years why not what, what, what's what's the real harm in that Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially if you're the Chargers, for instance. I mean, uh, I'm not really sure how much cap room they've got right now. Looks like they've got a decent amount of cap room. So, uh, I mean, Phillip Rivers, Tom Brady you would think would be an upgrade over Phillip Rivers, and it certainly would raise their profile in the L.A. market. It would probably push them above the the Los Angeles Rams to some degree, especially after the Rams kind of struggled in 2019 a little bit. opening up a new stadium. I don't know. I mean, if the Chargers could like could, could afford Tom Brady, then, yeah, I think that they should absolutely show interest in him. Uh, I've seen some people talk about the Chargers' weapons, but uh, Melvin Gordon is a free agent. Hunter Henry is a free agent. So, really, you're only totally talking about uh, Keenan Allen, Austin Eckler, and Mike Williams being their offensive weapons. So, you kind of have to wonder how well – Tom Brady would acclimate not only with new weapons, but potentially new offensive coordinator as well. I guess that could be a situation where uh, the Chargers could, you know, sign Tom Brady and then also hire Chad O'Shea as their offensive coordinator, uh, get kind of a package deal or some other offensive coordinator that that Tom Brady respects and could run his offense. But um, I don't know. I I still think the, the highest probability is that he comes back to the Patriots in in 2020, but I certainly don't think that it's a foregone conclusion. I I agree with that. It's, I'm wondering if he, I mean, I don't know the answer to this question, but if he is going to explore options and have a grass is always greener kind of thing, because he, if he, the things that you mentioned, if he goes to a new team, most likely have to learn a new offense or have to have his offense learned by the rest of the team, Right. Yeah. would have to integrate and, and build trust and all that with a whole new cast of characters, cast of offensive weapons, and uproot the life that he's had here for 20 years, uproot right. his family, uproot his business, all of that, and then probably has to go to, to OTAs and minicamp because I can't imagine you would show up on on July 28th if you're playing for the Chargers in your first year. And I think he does anyway. You think he does anyway? You think he has two weeks of practice and then goes into his first no, preseason no, no. I, game? I think that Tom Brady needs to show up for OTAs even if he comes to the oh, Patriots. I, I think it would definitely be in his best interest. Yeah. I don't know if he would. I don't know if he will either, but I think it's a bad luck coming off the season they did in 2019. And I'm not saying it was a disastrous season or anything. The Patriots still went 12-4, and four, but Brady was below average in basically every single statistical category this season. Yep. And I feel like that almost needs to be built into his contract if the Patriots do resign that, okay, stop messing around, come to OTAs next season because you need to work with Nikhil Harry, you need to work with Mohamed Sanu, and you need to work with whatever new tight ends or wide receivers we bring, we bring in here next year. Yeah, because there's there's only so much griping that, that Tom Brady can do about how difficult it is right. to, to build trust with these guys, young players, you know, it takes so long, blah, blah, blah. If you kind of forego a, a month, month and a half of working on field with these guys, it, it kind of hurts your case a little bit right. to uh, to be able to complain about not being on the same page. For sure. Uh, let's, you know, I don't want to get too deep down this rabbit hole, but um, if Tom Brady does not come back next season, then as I mentioned, the Patriots quarterbacks are um, are Jarrett Siddham and Cody Kessler. So obviously that wouldn't do unless the Patriots have a lot of faith in Jarrett Siddham and like Cody Kessler more than the rest of the NFL. Uh, but let's just, I'm going to throw out the free agent quarterbacks for next season. Uh, Drew Brees, Eli Manning, Philip Rivers, Teddy Bridgewater, Jameis Winston, Marcus Mariota, Ryan Tannehill, Dak Prescott, Taysom Hill, Nick Mullins, and Kyle Allen. 
and then some potential trade candidates as well. Uh, I throw in Andy Dalton, Joe Flacco, Nick Foles, Derek Carr, Jacoby Brissett, Alex Smith, and Cam Newton. Out of that entire group, uh, what do you think is the best fit? Or who do you think would be the best fit? The best fit. <sighs> or it's... the most likely candidate, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I could definitely see... I could see Tannehill if he's let go, but right. I don't know if the if the Titans are that might require Brady this. going to the Titans. True. Yeah. Um, Teddy Bridgewater would probably make sense as a guy who started games in the league, kind of a bridge guy. Yeah. Um, Dak Prescott would be fun. He's probably going to make too much money. Right. I would love that to might s- require Brady going yeah. to the Cowboys. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to see Eli. I would love to see Nick Foles oh, God, just for Eli. a just for a uh, yeah uh, an anarchy perspective. Um, Car would be if the if the yeah. if the Raiders got Brady. I guess. I mean, one other thing to to at least throw out there is if for some reason the Forty Nine ers uh, just come out uh, the, this weekend and are terrible and Jimmy G is horrendous, then is there a possibility that yes. Brady could go Give to the Forty Nine ers and the me. Patriots trade for Jimmy Garoppolo? <laughs> that would be the the one other trade candidate oh, if that. if everything goes completely haywire next weekend with that, the Forty Nine ers. That would be phenomenal. <laughs> um, I don't know. Looking at this list, it, it depends on how much they like Jared Stidham, but I think that like someone like Marcus Mariota would be easy to bring in, yeah. just compete for it. Um, or maybe they draft a quarterback in the first round and bring in a guy like Marcus Mariota just to see if you can you know, rehab his NFL potential a little bit. Do, um, do you think they need – let's theoretically say Tom Brady does leave and they do try to draft somebody because I think it would be in their best interest – regardless of how they feel about Jared Stidham, do you think they need a veteran who has started games and played in the league in camp? Or is can Cody Kessler be that kind of stand-in for the moment? Like, if, if the right. Patriots enter training camp with Jared Stidham, Cody Kessler, and Jake Fromm or Jacob right. Eason or whoever, whoever that rookie would be, is that a, a disaster situation? Oh do you need somebody who can, who can have, at the very least be kind of replacement level? Um, that's a good question because I don't know. Cody Kessler, like, <laughs> he could, has started games, could be that guy, and but uh, it's a it's a really good question. Um, I sort of feel like he could be that guy, and what's the point in bringing in Marcus Mariota? Mm-hmm. If you do draft a guy in the first round and you if you like Jared Sidham and if Cody Kessler can can get you through training camp or the preseason, then I don't know, maybe not because because then at that point, if it's not Marcus Mariota, then who are you bringing in at that point? You yeah. know, like I, I didn't look to see who were the kind of um, the the non starting caliber for agent quarterbacks that are out there. Uh, let me see here. This is great podcasting right now. Because <laughs> um, I, I think like Chase Daniel. Yeah, Chase yeah. Daniel. Um, but he hasn't even started games. Yeah. Case Keenum, Chad Henney, um, AJ McCarron. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. There, there's not a lot. Josh McCown. Like, are you really going to bring Trevor Simeon? I, I don't know. I don't think that there's there's really an obvious guy out there who – you wouldn't have to spend that much money on to, to at least be that guy in training camp. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not a great list out there, right? Um, and and yeah, it, Cody Kessler probably is the 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 Brian Hoyer, I guess, of of this whole group. Right. But just a guy who has been in the league, and you at least know that he knows how to play quarterback in the NFL. But yeah, man, this is this is going to be. We can obviously have this discussion in in more detail if Tom Brady does end up leaving but it's going to be this this is going to be the biggest Boston sports story in like decades if right. if Tom Brady leaves and the Patriots whoever ends up being that first guy to take over for Tom Brady it's it's crazy honestly that's all i can say yeah i mean unless they really did make a splash move like trading for Cam Newton or um <laughs> you know signing Teddy Bridgewater or something that's just why i feel like it is more likely that they just bring Tom Brady back because yeah. why are you going to spend as much money on Jameis Winston as you would for Tom Brady? You know, like it, it just at that point, it probably doesn't make sense unless there's some other bigger splash signing or, or trade that we're not even looking at. 
it probably just does make the most sense to bring back Tom Brady. But I, I personally do wonder how good he would he'll be next season unless the Patriots do try to you know refill those offensive weapons a little bit I think that they do need to bring in either a top tight end or a top wide receiver just to get Brady back to that you know above average quarterback level because this season kind of proved that he wasn't going to be on that level with the with the current offensive weapons which I actually don't think were that bad um I was actually listening to Bill Simmons podcast today and he was talking about the Saints, about how they had um, Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara, and Jared Cook, and how all three of those guys were better than anyone the Patriots had. I'm like, they've got Julian Edelman. Like, yeah. I feel like we're really discounting Julian Edelman here. And then just from a pure pass-catching perspective, is Alvin Kamara a better pass-catcher than James White? Like, I feel like, yeah, they're, they might not be traditional weapons in the Patriots' offense, but James White and Julian Edelman are two very good weapons, and they might not be Odell Beckham or Michael Thomas, but I don't know. I, I th- This team did have capable weapons. They just – some of them didn't get on the same page as Brady this season. Yeah, I, I think the the people who say that Belichick didn't do anything to get weapons around Tom Brady and, and that whole um, storyline, it's – I mean, ultimately the weapons that he got did not work out. Right. But that, that doesn't mean to me – that it was kind of a neglectful, um, neglectful performance in right. In, There's two ways to look at it. Yeah, because yeah. you have you have a um, a first round draft pick, and you have a guy in Muhammad Sanu who you sent, traded a second round draft pick for, who's been a very good number two. He had 800 yards for last all year. of his career. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean behind behind AJ Green and behind Julio Jones, he's he was a very very quality. Um, quality option there and you're basically asking him to do the same thing behind Julian Edelman here and for whatever reason he wasn't able to do it whether it was the injuries or whether it was uh, just not being able to get on the same page with Tom Brady which was really surprising because he's considered such an intelligent player and such a uh, um, yeah it's such an intelligent player and a guy that's easy to work with but didn't work out for whatever reason I think outside of tight end which you can definitely criticize the Patriots had what should have been a pretty good group of offensive weapons. Right. This wasn't as good as they've had a couple of years ago. It was no 16 or, or even 17 or even even last year. I mean, this is this group this year was basically what the group was last year when Rob Gronkowski was hurt. Right. Essentially. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. One yeah, and I don't know. Yeah, they, I mean, it's like I said, there there's two like you can blame the offensive weapons for the reason why the Patriots offense didn't produce this season. You can also blame Tom Brady, but that, but you can also say that they have talent and that it wasn't through the fault of, of yeah. Bill Belichick because, yeah, and he did sign Demarius Thomas. He did sign Antonio Brown. He did uh, draft Sonny Michel last year and Nikhil Harry this year. He did trade for Mohamed Sanu. And I mean, Sanu was on pace for, if he had continued on with the Falcons, he was on pace for a 715 yard season. He wound up with 520 yards. So coming to the Patriots basically wound up decreasing his projection by 200 yards. So, and I think that the the high ankle sprain certainly didn't help him in that regard. Um, and he looked fairly decent in what was it his second game with the Patriots yeah. when he had 10 catches for 81 yards, but he just never really refound that potential. But um, just one other question before we get out of here. Other than Tom Brady, who is your second most important free agent to sign this offseason? Well, it, the, the top I, candidates, as I mentioned, Jamie Collins would be in there. Um, Devin McCourty would be in there. I guess Matthew my, Slater, Joe for, Tooney, it Kyle would, Van Noy. It would be Joe Tooney, but I don't think they're going to be able to re-sign him. I agree, Just yeah. because they already gave Shaq Mason a five-year, $50 million contract last year. Tooney had a phenomenal season. He's probably going to be if not the number one guard on the market, at the very least one of the, the two or three best, I think he's going to get a deal that's too expensive for the Patriots to, to match. Uh, it seems like it's a guy they definitely would like to keep around. Right. I'm, I'm, I believe that he would like to be around too, but I think just monetarily it's not going to work out. Beyond that, Devin McCourty probably. Yeah. Um, Kyle Van Noy would be nice to bring back, but I think he's gone. I think he's going to make too much money else, elsewhere. He's kind of come out and said that, that he's not going to uh, – to right. take a, a discounted deal to stay with the Patriots. Um, so of that group, I would say Devin McCourty is is probably at the top of that list other than Joe Tooney. I don't know, what's, what's your read on that? Yeah, I would go – I would probably go 
McCordy. Then uh, McCordy and Tooney are really even, and then I'd go Van Noy. Um, but, yeah, I can't see Tooney coming back just because he's going to want top dollar. And the deal that the Patriots gave Shaq Mason was actually sort of below market at the yeah. time. So you're talking about paying Tooney significantly more than Shaq Mason at this point, which I can't see them doing. You can't tie up all that money in two guards. Van Noy, it'll just be interesting, interesting to see his market. I wonder if teams will still sort of hold those Lions ears against him since he was so much more productive in the Patriots offense than he was in Detroit. I think that he could be productive anywhere he goes, but just kind of curious to see what he gets on the open market, whether he's valued as a linebacker, as an edge rusher, what he is. Uh, But one other one just to mention is that Dante Hightower has a $11.3 million cap hit this season. Patriots could free up uh, about $8.8 million by cutting him. Uh, or they could maybe reach an extension and try to you know, free up some of that cap room. So it would be interesting to see what happens there with Dante Hightower this year as well, since the Patriots will be sort of up against the cap a little bit. But yeah, a lot of decisions to be made, none of which are more important than Tom Brady. Uh, but I think that will do it for now for the Nesson Patriots podcast. We will be back basically the next time something crazy happens and, and we'll kind of keep everyone up to date on everything that's happening this off season. Definitely. It's going to be fun to uh, watch some football this weekend. <laughs> it certainly will be. Yeah. It, I certainly wish that I would have been in Kansas city, but uh, yeah, there, there is still football to watch. <laughs>